Uh, we've studied the great uh, flood. That's what we were talking about uh, in the last couple of lessons. And I said that the great flood had a dramatic effect on the world, just to review here briefly. First of all, the environment changed completely from a balanced, cooperative one to an environment of decay, drastic weather, and challenge in which to live. The interesting thing is that after the flood, the climate began to change. And people think today, you know, they've discovered something new. There's climate change, they call it. They've even coined a term. But the climate began to change after the flood and not for the better. So that's one of the dramatic changes brought about, brought about by the great flood. Secondly, society was wiped out and a new society was begun through Noah's three sons and wives. So a whole new society was now uh, about to emerge. Thirdly, the spiritual promise was kept alive through Noah and then through his son Shem and uh, the descendants from Shem. So that seed promise continues. Remember I talked to you about the wide angle and the close angle, you know, uh, when you're studying Genesis, those who wrote the book of Genesis would take a wide view of history and you'd get a kind of a wide view of what's going on. The, the description of the flood, for example, that's a wide view. And then you'd get a close up view you know, of, of, of Noah talking to his sons and what happened between Noah and his son. That's a close up view. And then you have uh, what we call today subplots. You know? And there are two main subplots, one of them is how the Bible traces through, the, you know, through, through history the seed of promise, the promise made originally to Eve that there would be a seed and that seed, through that seed there would be salvation somehow and you see how that, that thread of the seed of promise you know, is being explained all the, way through the, all the way through the Bible. That's one subplot and the other subplot is the battle between the seed of promise and the seed of the devil trying to destroy at every turn, trying to stop that promise from being fulfilled. And you'll read about that all the way through the uh, Old Testament, certainly all the way through uh, Genesis. So the wide view was the destruction of the world and the changes that took place along with God's promise to sustain man into the future. Then we had what's called the rainbow covenant to preserve the world from a water catastrophe in the future, and the rainbow was the sign that God had made that covenant with mankind. So now we have the close-up view. The close-up view was the interaction between Noah and his sons, and remember last time, the very last time we met, uh, I explained to you the prophecies that Noah made for each one of his sons. Again, review those. First of all, that Ham, and his descendants would be servants of the world as well as servants of his brothers. In other words, the descendants of Ham would serve the interests of the others and not necessarily be the, quote, slave of the others. Secondly, the prophecy of Shem, that Shem would excel in spiritual things. And we know that he did because Jesus comes through the Shem or the Semite, Semitic people, Semitic people rather. And then the third one was Japheth. Japheth uh, would prosper and be at peace with his brother Shem. And we know that uh, many of the peoples that come from Japheth, the Romans for example, Greeks, the Europeans, you know, had tremendous prosperity in their lineage. So this discussion of future genera uh, generations kind of widens in the 10th and 11th chapter of Genesis to include more information about the descendants of these men and how they developed into nations. So we follow this to a point in history where the explosion of tongues and cultures takes place and where the Bible is no longer going to trace the development of various subcultures but it will once again go into a kind of a close-up view of one man and the nation that he will be the father of. So what I'm trying to explain is for a time the Bible has taken the big view, how the nations developed, where they all came from, the sources, okay? But then eventually it'll, it'll let that go and then focus in not just on one nation, but it'll focus in on just one single person, Abraham, 
and it'll begin telling how God developed one single nation through that one man, and most of the Bible information will be about that one nation. And there'll be some talk of other nations, you know what I mean, to kind of give some historical perspective, but the main message and the main information will be just about one, one man, one family, and then one nation as it develops, and of course we know that's the Jewish nation. So in the lesson that we're going to look at today, two main items, one, the table of nations. In other words, which nations come from which of these, you know, Ham, uh, Japheth, and uh, uh, Shem, which nations come out of these? And then we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel, okay, the Tower of Babel. So chapter 10 of Genesis contains written information, very interesting, Chapter 10 of Genesis contains written information that archeologists say does not appear anywhere else in written form. Okay? In other words, the records of ancient civilizations that existed in these days are not recorded in any other document other than in the biblical records. However, there are artifacts that substantiate their existence. So they have things, you know, pots and writings and you know, whatever, you know, buildings and towns, and you know, they have things that say these people existed, but they have no writing in any book that substantiates it other than in the Bible. Only the Bible has records of some of these ancient uh, cultures and civilizations. So the Bible is the only document that confirms the existence of these peoples and is very accurate according to archeological findings. Uh, I just quoted here Dr. William F. Albright, who's an archeologist. I'm not saying that the Bible has documents of all the nations. I'm just saying that some of the nations that are named here are not named anywhere else, but are confirmed by archeological findings, okay? All right, so let's go to chapter 10, and we're going to read uh, verses one to five. Chapter 10, one to five, beginning with chapter one. It says, now these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togarmah. The sons of Javan were Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. And so he names, the writer here names Japheth first because he may have been the eldest. Shem is named last because he is in keeping the record of the sons of Noah. So allowing for the general change in names, researchers follow these sons as the fathers of different nations. Uh, his ancestors include modern day Europe. Let me just give you one more slide. Here we go, Japheth. His ancestors include modern day Europe, India, and some of the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, it's the first time that the term Gentile is used. It means, as here in, in this version, uses the word nation, okay? More specifically, foreign nation. This verse was written after the Tower of Babel because it describes an event it describes the differences in languages and that only occurred after the Tower of Babel incident. So let's keep reading. Verse, uh, chapter 10, verse six, we'll just do verse six to 10. It says, the sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim and Put and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Rama and Septica and the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Didan. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. 
The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. And so um, Shem lists the ge genealogy of Japheth only to the second generation, you know, the, what we talked about before. But now he talks about Ham and he gives three uh, generations and for his own, he, he goes to the fifth generation. He even talks more about his own generations than he does about his brothers. Of course, he talks about Ham to make sure that all nations could be traced and the origin and development of each nation could be recorded. So he's recording this with the view that in the future people would be looking at these records and would be able to trace back which nation came from which, which family. So Ham's descendants include many of the peoples in the area of Syria and Iraq, Arabia, Egypt, and African nations, as well as the Oriental people and the original peoples of North and South America. I'm not talking about, quote, Americans, I'm talking about Indians and, uh, and the First Nations, uh, Native Americans we say here in the United States, in Canada we say First Nations. Um, he mentions one person in particular, and that is Nimrod, very interesting, who was Ham's grandson. Now the name of uh, Nimrod, uh, it means rebellion. So if you're thinking of naming your children or grandchildren Nimrod, you might be having problems by the time they get to be teenagers, you know, so be careful there. His name means rebellion or let us rebel. And it suggests that the power of sin was already growing strong in the hearts of men. Remember in those days, names meant something. It, it, it tried to capture your essence, okay? So God has given commands, right? The commands that God has given is they must disperse. They need to replenish the earth. They also need to honor God. Those are the commands that Noah is working with. But we see in Nimrod's actions in verses 9, 10, and 11 that instead of dispersing, he regroups and he tries to consolidate different groups under his leadership and he builds a complex of cities with a capital, Babel, the capital, and himself as the king. Now that he was a great hunter suggests that he may have been a great warrior, and he may have been one that had weapons. This was not in the Lord's plan. God gave no plan for any man to be king over other men. That's not what he said. They were in cooperation with one another to go and replenish the earth. They had to subdue the earth. They had to start over again. But God didn't give any, anyone the right to be a king or to receive honor from other men. The only honor given was the honor that men would give to God. Or to enrich in oneself instead of re replenishing the earth. You know, God didn't give men at this point in time uh, the command that go out and get rich at the expense of others. Get others to work for you so you could be rich. That was not the plan at this time. So we see the, you know, the seeds of the eventual rebellion beginning to be sown here in the family of Nimrod. That's why, uh, that's why, he is, that's why he's mentioned. Now the Canaanites, again uh, descendants of Ham, the Canaanites eventually come from Ham and much of their history is mentioned here. Again, Shem mentions it at the end that these things were written after the division of nations and tongues at Babel, probably to secure the original history of each group. So he's writing after you know, they've divided the languages and everything, but he's writing about a time before that. How the, how the different nations began to be formed, how the rebellion that took place at Babel, you know, who was the leader and how that thing began to form. Just, just a fascinating, fascinating um, uh, account of what takes place in, uh, in, this, uh, in this period. All right, so let's go to chapter 10. Uh, we're still in chapter 10, but verse 21. And let's read that. It says, 
also to Shem, now he's going to talk about his ancestors, because Shem is the one writing. Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, and the older brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem were Elam, and Ashur, and Arpachad, and Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash. Arpachshad became the father of Shelah, and Shelah became the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Very important. He just said, in his days, Peleg, the earth was divided. How was it divided? Well, the languages were divided. The people were divided, okay? And his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan became the father of Almodad and Sheleth, and Hazar Maveth and Jira, and Hadoram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal and Abimael and Sheba and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. All of these were the sons of Joktan. Now their settlement extended from Misha as you go towards Sifar, the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, by their nations, and out of these the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. Again, I repeat, people can say, I don't believe this, I don't accept this, I think, you know, people evolved from lower, you know, started with just a cell and it divided over a million, that's what I believe. And you know what? If that's what you want to believe, fine. And I've said this before. The thing you can't say, however, is that the Bible doesn't teach that all the earth that is populated now was populated from Noah and his three sons, okay? You're free to say, I don't accept that, fine. But you can't say that's not what it says. It's clear, he says, these are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies by their nations. And listen, and out of these, the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. The, from these three, all the nations came. That's what the scriptures teach. So we either accept that or we reject it, but we can't say that that's not what the Bible teaches or I misunderstood what the Bible teaches. So Shem describes his own genealogy by describing himself as the father of all the Ebers or Ebers. From this word comes the term Hebrew, okay? That's how we trace it back, which was used by the people to describe Abraham in Genesis 14, 13, who was a descendant of Eber. He mentions that the son of Eber was Peleg in verse 25 and that during this time the earth was divided, referring to the linguistic and geographical division that took place after the incident at the Tower of Babel. The significant person in the line is Arpachad, Arpachad, hard word to say, because he is in the line of the promised seed to Abraham. Okay, you, you follow through that line. Shem's descendants include, I need to give you one other, there we go. Shem's descendants include the Middle Eastern people, including, of course, the Jews. He summarizes his material in verse 32, saying that those are the origins of all the nations that were to follow. And in providing this, Shem establishes a historical link between the ancient patriarchs and the modern nations. So you remember when I said the table of nations? This is the table of nations. The table of nations includes 70 families listed. There may have been more, but 70 are listed. And this number, 70, becomes significant in future Jewish writings, because you have the 70 elders in Numbers, you have 70 scholars who translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, you know, the Septuagint, the 70 elders. You have 70 years of captivity, you have the 70, the Sanhedrin, you know, 70 is an important number for the Jews. All right, so this is the end 
of a kind of a wide angle view of history and now the Bible moves once again to a close up of one single incident that had as much impact on the social structure of the human race as the flood had on the environment and that is the Tower of Babel. If someone says, why are we where we are at? Why is the world like it is today? There are two major historical events. One, the great flood. The great flood explains why the earth is the way it is, why there is disease, you know, uh, why are there tornadoes and droughts? The, the great flood explains that. And then the other great event is the division of language. That's the other event that uh, explains why we have different cultures and languages and misunderstandings and so on and so forth. So now we're going to look at the Tower of Babel. So in the first few verses of chapter 11, we see the seeds of you know, pagan religion begin to be sown and the results of this, of course, is sin. In chapter 10, we read of Nimrod, the great ruler and the city builder, and he's probably the one who's going to be leading this effort right here. So we read in Genesis chapter 11, verse one. It says, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Again, you don't have to believe that. You can reject that, but the scripture teaches the development of human history, everyone spoke the same language. Before Babel, the entire population spoke only one language. Now, what's interesting is that some phonologists, those who study you know, language and words, some phonologists believe that the language that was used at that time was a form of Hebrew because certain symbols from the most ancient of discovered artifacts only find any correlation in the Hebrew language. They've taken the oldest things that they have, the oldest words, the oldest symbols, and they've tried to match them to various languages and ancient languages, and the only uh, language that corresponds at all with the ancient things is the, is the Hebrew language. Certainly, the Hebrew language is the oldest recorded language. Uh, Shem, who was the father of the Hebrews, that goes all the way back to the flood. Um, in modern day uh, writing, Chinese is the oldest continually written language. It's about 4,500 years old. So, um, this was to support God's, the fact that everyone spoke the same language. This was to support God's original purpose of brotherhood and cooperative colonization and habitation on the earth. God wanted them to spread out, to colonize, to subdue the earth, to populate the earth, and so on and so forth. They all spoke the same language, easy to cooperate. You don't know how difficult that is until, for example, you, uh, you, uh, you try to run any enterprise that has more than one language group. Like in Montreal, where Hal and I were for many years, I mean, we had 18 different language groups. I, I mean, we had 100 people in that church and they spoke 18 different languages. There were 18 different cultures represented in that 100 people. Can you imagine how difficult it was to communicate with them in any way? I mean, anything you said. One time, you know, I, I was trying to give an example and I said, yeah, it's like the great baseball player, Babe Ruth. You know Babe Ruth? You know Babe Ruth? You know Babe Ruth? You, the youngest one back there, you know Babe Ruth, right? You were alive when Babe Ruth was here, maybe. Anyways. <laughs> Right? We know Babe Ruth. I said Babe Ruth and it was like, nobody, nobody, well maybe Hal the American, you know what I'm saying? Nobody knew who Babe Ruth was. I had to say, okay, wait a minute, I gotta, I gotta find somebody you know, who's a, an international uh, sports person, you know, Pele, you know, the soccer player. Oh, some people say, oh yeah, yeah, Pele, sure, we get it. So can you imagine trying, and that's just, a one hour service we're trying to do with all Christians there. 
Can you imagine trying to run an enterprise, build a house, build a building with people? Uh, my daughter-in-law, her parents went to China and he went there as a kind of a supervisor to build a theater, okay, where they were going to show plays and so on and so forth. And he said, wow, it was crazy trying to communicate. Just, uh, I was English, they were Chinese. They didn't speak English, I didn't speak Chinese, and we're trying to build a building. Can you imagine the, they never built it. I mean, he just, he quit in frustration, you know, they, they just couldn't communicate properly. Did you improve your Panama skills? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have to do that for sure. So we, 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 we see the reason for the, the, the unity in language, it's serving God's purpose, okay? So let's read verse two. It says, it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. So we see the migration from Ararat, that's where the, 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 the boat, uh, the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat. So we see a migration from Ararat take place. A concentration of peoples in what is presently known as Iraq. Okay. So let's keep reading verse three and four. It says, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. And so the purpose of God was to scatter and colonize. That purpose is now challenged. What happens? Well, and we say Nimrod's rebellion, they wanted to remain centralized in the same place. They didn't want to spread out. They said, hey, this is a nice place. We can build a city here. Let's stick together. They begin a brick making industry as a way to provide work and supplies to establish an urban center. And then a new philosophy is developed to avoid being scattered and to establish a physical monument that will represent the religious aspect of the people's experience, as well as their unity and their strength. You know, their strength in unity, isn't it? That's, that's what they wanted to do. Well, of course, the idea here was that their strength came from the Lord, not from their unity. Their strength came from the Lord. The Lord would provide for them no matter where they went, as long as, he was, as, long as they were obeying His commands. Of course, the thing that represents the people's religious beliefs, their faith, well, that's obedience to God, not sacrifice, not monuments. That's not, that's, God's not looking for monuments. He's looking for obedience. He's looking for faithfulness, right? So this area is the ancient beginning of Babylon, from which all the ancient occult and pagan practices begin. You know, brothers and sisters, I don't want to get political, but <laughs> There's a reason why the war never ends over there. <laughs> because that's where the confusion started. And continued then and continues now and will continue forward. So anyways, don't get me started. So the tower is the first such paganistic attempt to replace the worship of the Creator with the worship of the created. It didn't actually go up to heaven, but it represents heaven and its, and its hosts. So instead of obeying God, the people build a great city and a great religious monument, thinking that they could do what they wanted and still please God. Won't God be pleased with that? Isn't that what Saul thought? Lord, I brought all these you know, sheep and cattle. I brought the best of everything from the enemy to offer a sacrifice. And God said, no, no, I, I told you to kill them all. I didn't tell you to bring anything here. I want obedience, he says, not sacrifice, not monuments. So let's keep reading. It says, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. And so the problem is now established. The unity of man based on his common language has been used to create a rebellion 
that threatens God's original plan. Remember, what is God's plan? The plan is to bring the Savior to the earth. But in this new order, the memory and the worship of God as well as His promise, this will all be completely forgotten. The, the seed, the whole thing is going to go down the drain because they're going to build you know, their tower and they're going to build their temple. That man can do anything means that without the restraint of God's word, man can fall into any wickedness leading to his complete self-destruction. And so God therefore will intervene once again, but this time not with a destructive flood. So we read verses seven to nine, it says, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So the strength of the people is a common language through which one leader is manipulating them and so the way to dissolve the power is to multiply the tongues. If the power is in the fact that they all speak the same language, the way to break the power is to break up the languages. In doing so, it created confusion for the building of one central location and migration, which is what God wanted, soon began along with population expansion as well as social and cultural diversification. Now, since there were smaller groups or tribes that shared a language, the marrying was done within a smaller circle. And this smaller circle of reproduction is one reason for a faster rate of genetic mutations, which is combined with the, uh, which is considered rather the primary factor in the development of different hair and skin and eye types. People say, well, where do they all come from? Well, they come from this type of intermarrying that took place at a time before it was actually dangerous to do so. Since this was early in man's development, it was still genetically possible without danger to do this. There would be mutations, there would be changes in eye color and eye displacement, the skin type, hair. You know, the, the mutations would not be harmful, they would simply make you different. But as time went on, and there was more and more of this, the mutations actually became dangerous to uh, human survival. And so uh, with time, Moses, especially at Moses' time, Moses makes laws. In other words, not Moses, but God gives to Moses laws which forbid this type of intermarrying. Uh, so the giving of language at the creation of Adam, um, it was a miracle. Very interesting. And then the multiplying of the tongues at Babel, that was a similar miracle. But isn't it interesting to note that the first miracle was done when God's plan for salvation is finally relieved at Pentecost? What's the miracle there? Speaking in tongues. It's exactly the reverse of Babel. <laughs> so he divides the languages at Babel, he unifies the languages miraculously at Pentecost. Why? So the gospel can be, the gospel can be preached. Uh, Hal and I often say, and today in, in, with our technology, uh, it's possible to speak to everybody in the whole world because through the internet, you know, I mean, with time, maybe, maybe during my lifetime, you know, let's say I got another 20 years or so, within my lifetime, it would be possible because practically the entire world, everybody will have access to the internet. And so uh, distance won't count anymore. Even language won't count. They're coming up with uh, software these days where you can, you can speak into it in one language and it comes out the other end in another language that you choose. So there's great possibilities there for preaching the gospel. But anyways, so the word Babel means to mingle or to mix and this is why this term is given to this place. Let's read a couple of more verses here in chapter 10. 
It says, the beginning of this kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and uh, Rehoboth, Ur, and Kala. And I think I have another verse here, no. All right, I'll just stop there for a second. So at verse 10, another writer, and this time it's Terah, takes up the history of the seed by mentioning how long Shem lived and establishing the connection between Shem and himself through a Aparkatsad, through Terah and Abram, who was later to be called Abraham. No social history or numbers given here except the ages of the patriarchs, and the purpose here is to trace the key people in the line through which the promise came. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't read this here. It says, Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah. Sarah was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So Terah's record now ends, and another writer picks up the narrative, probably Isaac is writing by this time. He names the three sons of Terah, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and he gives a brief family description of each of them. Haran died young. Nahor married his dead brother's daughter, would have been his niece. Abram married his half-sister Sarai, who is said to be barren at this time. And so chapter 11 closes with Terah uh, leaving Ur, which was a wicked city, to go northward to Haran to settle, and then he dies there. Now there's some speculation that he was called to go to Canaan, but he refused to go further than Haran, at which time God called Abram to leave and go forward to Canaan. In other words, it was like a two-step process. He called Haran, thinking, you know, the, some speculate he called Haran to go to, to the land of Canaan, and Haran only went so far. And then Abram carried on and went uh, when he was called. All right, so the table, we've done a lot in one lesson here, the table of nations, you know, the history of civilization, and then the division of languages, so there's a lot, of, a lot of work. Let me give you some, some bonus stuff here about a ziggurat, ziggurat. Um, you know the Tower of Babel? You see some pictures of the Tower of Babel and you see this thing that kind of, you know, it spirals up, looks like a, you know, a Dairy Queen cone, you know, it spirals up. Uh, that's not exactly what these things look like. They were called ziggurat. Researchers believe that the Tower of Babel was a form of tower called a ziggurat. It's an ancient word meaning to build a raised area. To build a raised area. Uh, there are still remains of these types of towers still in Iraq and Iran. Not just a tower, uh, because like in those pictures you just see a tower. It wasn't really a tower, but it was a series of buildings, a complex with a shrine on top. So you notice in the picture that's up on the slide there, notice that there were stairs, narrow stairs on different sides of it, narrow because they were easy to defend. In other words, you didn't have to have a lot of defenders at the top because the, the stairs were narrow, not a big army could get, they were one at a time, you know, you pick them off one at a time. And, and inside these rooms, these buildings, there were the places for the priests and storehouses and so on and so forth. And then at the very top there, you see at the very top, that's where the temple or the worship area would be. And so when we're thinking of the Tower of Babel, we're thinking about one of these type of things that was uh, built. Another interesting one, this is the ziggurat of Ur, okay? This is the ziggurat of Ur in Iraq, the actual one, all right, uh, one view of it. It was built, uh, this is not the Tower of Babel, that's, that's much too old. This one was built uh, in about 2000 BC, still very ancient, but it was built in about 2000 BC. 
Uh, and this is what remains of it today, one view of it. Okay? It almost, I mean, the uh, archaeologists have kind of worked on it and dug it up and so on and so forth. Interesting, this is the other side of it. This is what has been rebuilt to scale. And you notice the soldiers, those are American soldiers there when they were in Iraq. Um, uh, you can see you know, the steps, that's a rebuilding of the steps to one of the, one of the steps to go up to one of the levels of the tower. But if you see, you notice just to the right of the stairs, uh, or would it be, yeah, to the right of the stairs, you see this kind of something that's on top there, it looks like a rock or something. That's the ancient one, that's the actual one that's back there. Remember I showed you the actual one? That's the actual one, and this is kind of the rebuilding of what it must have looked like uh, at the time. All right, so just to give you a mental image of what we're talking about here. Uh, next time we're going to talk about the chosen nation. So like I said, we've had the wide view, you know, the flood and the uh, you know, the, 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 the division of language, the Tower of Babel and all that. Next week we're going to focus in, okay, we've we finally gotten to Abraham. So now when we get to Abraham, the story's going to speed up a little bit as far as us covering material, because now it's just the narrative. Now we're going to be just following this seed here, this one family. All right, still a lot of great material, but we're going to focus in and speed up as we go through.